Weapons, I want to be in the middle. Right. Is it? Thank you for your warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert McBride of All Classical Portland. It's a radio station. Oh, oh that they like one. it. That one. Yay, thank you. Come on in, yes. And this guy over here, you know, is Carlos Calmar, music director Hi. of the Oregon Symphony. Good evening. This gentleman is Kenji Bunch, who does double duty tonight as violist and composer, which is unusual. Hi. So Kenji is from Portland, lived in New York for quite a while, went to Juilliard, and then moved back here two, three years ago or something. Almost four years. Wow. Yeah. Time flies. And he's a very fine violist, and you'll see him in the viola section tonight some of the time. It's kind of an odd thing. He's not going to play the first half, right? And then you'll be listening to your piece. Uh, actually, sorry, I, I, nobody told you. Uh, sir, apologies from my side. I reversed the order of the program. <laughs> everything, just put everything upside down, you're fine. So are we starting with him? No. no we're, we're starting every, with the, the Okay, Dvorak. so that I knew. Dvorak, intermission, right. bunch, right. barber. So then the only... The only music you're playing is Barber. Well, coincidentally, I'm, I happen to be the last violist this week, the last chair. It, it, we rotate, and I, it just happens that I'm the last person. So uh, they, they don't uh, want me for the divorce. Oh, Kenji. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it, the, you know, you have to think about the, the balance of how many strings are playing right. with a soloist, so sometimes the last person or two gets cut uh, for that piece, and, and I happen to be cut for the Dvorak, so I'll enjoy it from the, the hall. No, wait a minute, but you are playing your piece. Uh, tomorrow night I, I am. Tomorrow, Ten, but tonight, not tonight. I, I wanted a, a night in the hall to hear what it actually sounds uh, like. Well, you deserve that. So, thanks. <laughs> All right, so I want to ask you a bunch of questions. No, no pun intended. When no, no pun intended. Very good. Can't you bunch? <laughs> okay, so question number one. When did they ask you to write this piece? They, the Oregon Symphony. About a year, year and a half ago, maybe? When did you start writing it? That, that's hard to, to really uh, determine. I mean, um, I started thinking about it as soon as I right. was approached with the project. And, and that's the, the hardest part, I think, is um, trying to figure out uh, what, what I'm gonna do. Well, when did you come up with the elephant story idea? Do you know the title of this piece? Have you, have you looked? It's the best title in music these days. <laughs> Thanks. It, it's called Aspects of an Elephant. And um, yeah, I, I, I struggled longer than I normally do to uh, come up with some sort of concept for this piece. Uh, the one thing I did know that I wanted to do was to create a, a kind of a concerto for orchestra type of of piece where I, I really highlight individual uh, musicians and groups of instruments uh, in in the orchestra. Since I know them so well, they're my friends and colleagues, and I, I wanted to, to feature them. Uh, so I knew I wanted to do that, but I also wanted some kind of extra musical... Um, story or, or some concept to work with. And finally I decided, uh, I guess this would have been sometime in the fall, that uh, the, the old parable of the uh, so-called uh, the blind men and the elephant parable, uh, it's something that's been around since the 13th century. I think originally it came from India, but it, you see it all over the world. And um, in different tellings of it, uh, the, the common thing is there are always a, a group of people, of men in a, a room with an elephant and they can't see the elephant. The version I like the best uh, is uh, described by the poet Rumi and the, the men are not blind. They're, they're just in a dark room and they can't see the elephant. And each one is holding a little candle and is uh, touching a different part of the animal, and with someone touching the tusk and the trunk and the tail and the leg and the, the back, they all have wildly different ideas of what an 
elephant is, uh, and they're all uh, totally certain that they're correct. Uh, and they get in this big argument about it, and as they're arguing, they get closer to each other, and as they get closer to each other, the, the light from their individual candles is enough for them all to see what the, the animal really is. Uh, so, it, it, uh, it, in my piece, I call that part the creature revealed. And uh, on the, the one literal level, the, the elephant is revealed. The, the true nature of the beast is revealed. Um, but perhaps metaphorically, uh, their own human nature is, is revealed and what's uh, common about the human experience. Uh, so you might differ with uh, politics or spirituality or your outlook on the world, but uh, there's a, a common um, empathy about the human condition that uh, runs deeper than that. I'm already loving the piece, and I haven't heard a note of it yet, just because of all of that. <laughs> all right. So when did you find out about that concept? Well, uh, I can, of course, tell the... <laughs> the so the, essentially, uh, this started before we came to, to Kenji. So this started in Chicago, kind of, because we commissioned a piece in my festival in Chicago uh, by Kenji, and it turned out to be a magnificent piece of music. And so when, we, uh, when I returned to Portland and we were in artistic discussing, well, it's time to um, actually commission, I said, well, it's very obvious to me, let's look no further. Kenji, just, he's here, I just premiered a piece by him, he's really good. So we approached him, he was of course thrilled, honored, da da da, and then are all these months in this year where I, we, we crossed each other in the, in the hallway, in the intermission of rehearsals, and I always looked at him and said, Kenji, where is my piece? That's exactly what he said. Yeah. And they think, because he described it correctly, he said, it's actually here. And he was really the gestation of, here was quite long. <laughs> and the, I mean, the, the, the interesting uh, thing about this piece, if you, you, it's your piece, you have to correct me all the time, is it talks act actually about an elephant somewhat, and it describes, I, I assume in the program notes, it's uh, the different movements. The elephant is a snake, the elephant is a spear, the elephant is a throne. It's not, to my understanding, it's not program music. Uh, at least I don't understand it as such. Meaning it's, yeah, you can, and it's more a character piece. You understand that the throne is something majestic that has, yeah, I know you used a very distinctive technique to write that movement. And of course, the snake, the snake has to move fast. It's a snake. Uh, or the silk cloth has to be somewhat music without weight, so it's, it doesn't have, and so on. And, the, and then one of the fascinating things is, uh, first of all, the second last movement, the argument, the man arguing, like in the story of Rumi, uh, which is in a way this old technique of you just put whatever you discussed in the former movements, you put one after the other and all of them against each other until everybody gets very agitated in the piece and probably there is some yelling going on and then it stops and becomes extremely quiet and very slow and then the thing that is called elephant, it can be something else, right? Somewhat is revealed. And that actually, at first, I tell you that when I read the score, the first time I was like, with, when the elephant appears, I was like, really? And then I started, even during rehearsal, I started to understand actually how, in a way, from my perspective, 
I'm not telling you you have to like this piece, uh, but I'm lobbying for it. <laughs> I'm lobbying for it. How intelligent this is, how intelligent the construction of the finale in conjunction to whatever you heard before. Yes, you will hear a lot of interesting sounds, highly atmospheric music, I think. The beginning is quite something, this darkness. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the reaction of the audience. I have good news. This concert is being recorded. Our friends from Sound Mirror are here again. And Kenji's piece and the Samuel Barber piece will be on an upcoming All-American CD with Carlos Kalmar and the Oregon Symphony. And as Kenji said backstage before we came out, a year from now, he'll be in the lobby signing CDs. <laughs> It'll be about that long until that comes out. But there are recordings in the lobby by the Oregon Symphony and by our guest soloist tonight, Harriet Kreich, and she will be at, there at intermission signing CDs. So did they stipulate for you exactly what, you know, you, you could use this many trumpets, this many trombones? Yeah, um, pretty much any, any commission is, all those details are, are very explicit. So the, the duration the, that yeah, they the, would like the it the duration be. and the instrumentation are the big things to agree on before anything gets started. So. And this is right on the heels of Kenji finishing a big ballet for Eugene Ballet. You've been a very busy man. Lucky to, to have the work. Yeah, and he's uh, the artistic director of Fear No Music, and they do fabulous things, and he teaches viola, and he teaches theory and composition, and, and he raises two kids, <laughs> and there's probably stuff that I don't happen to know about, too. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I wonder a little bit, <laughs> how is this moment, to, I mean, because you imagine, as you said, it's all here, Carlos, and then you write it down, and then comes the first rehearsal. Does it happen to you that you l sit there and you think like, either you say, this is actually cool, or you say like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> What happens? Well, I've been really fortunate to never have an oh boy experience, um, but I, I, I'm terrified before, right before the first rehearsal, always. And um, I, I made this illusion before, if any of you are familiar with The Music Man, um, the, the musical The Music Man, I always feel, right before the first reading of a new piece, I feel like, Professor Harold Hill, hoping to hear Beethoven's Minuet in G come out, <laughs> and, or something resembling it. So, yeah, and and then when I when I do hear the music, it's just a profound relief that it actually exists in the world. It sounds like what I was hearing in my head, and that I'm I'm not. <clears throat> That I'm actually not crazy. That it, it, it although he hears voices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is the first note that we'll hear in your piece tonight the first note that you wrote, or did you start somewhere else within it? Uh, this one I started with the the very first note, which, by the way, will be played by my wife. Well, that's <laughs> nice. Yeah, Monica Ouchi, wonderful pianist. Yeah. And, and executive director of Fear No Music. And yeah. She also teaches and raises two kids, and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and you know what they call their kids? Kenji and Monica Bunch? They call them the Bunchkins. <laughs> How cute is that? <laughs> they are the cutest family on Facebook on planet Earth. They are just great. So we should probably talk a little about Samuel Barber and Antonin Dvorak. But let me ask you one more thing. Yeah. So how are you like Samuel Barber and how are you not like Samuel Barber? I mean, he, another American composer, he's dead. But other than that, <laughs> what, do you have, what do you think you have in common with him? Gosh, I, I never thought of that. I, I mean, I, I'm a huge admirer of his work. Um, Knoxville, summer of 1915 is one of the all-time greats for me. Um, I, I never... You know what you should do? You should make an arrangement of that, scaling down the orchestra to the same instrumentation as the original version of Appalachian Spring. Whoa. That's oh. just a thought. 
It'll be fun. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Not that I'm going to pay you to do that, but you know. <laughs> I guess if I would compare myself to him in any way, I would say that I'm I love um, the same. I, I maybe share a harmonic sense with the, the, the same kind of vocabulary. And you're uh, working within an approachable tonal universe that draws on Americana or, or familiar things sometimes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Okay. Yeah. But he was not that's a violist. A, no, he was not. So in that respect, you are far superior. <laughs> <laughs> Dvorak was a violist. That's true. Yeah. He loved the instrument and rather reluctantly wrote a cello concerto, but it's become quite a hit. And Har Harriet Krieg, our soloist, Dutch cellist, is appearing here for the first time tonight. Harriet is actually appearing here in Portland, Oregon, for the first time uh, as a single soloist in the United States. We were just got, we got, just got beaten by the Boston Symphony. Uh, I think she was there two weeks ago. Uh, but she was just one of three soloists. They, uh, they premiered the world premiere of a triple concerto there of Sof Sofia Gubaidulina. Uh, but aside from that, this is her very first. And I'm very, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. In the, because this is, this is uh, one of those young, uh, tremendously talented musicians that uh, come from a very European school and then they are brought to us uh, or we bring them here and it's it's an entire new world for actually everybody because of course her approach uh, to this piece is very personal I must say uh, and without think too much. I think it's a little more lyrical. Not that than what you expect is because what can you expect about Dvorak cello concerto? Everything. It's just what it is and I, I am very very happy and it's actually interesting uh, to have a cello concerto by a composer Dvorak who actually s said actually writing a cello concerto so he sort of said writing a cello concerto is completely wrong never going to do this again. It's the best, by quite a bit, the best cello concerto that exists. And the composer said like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't, by the way, just to be specific, he didn't mean the composition. He meant more, it's, for him it was, and this struggle exists, so difficult to feature an instrument that is so beautiful it's just a little softer than some other. I mean, you hear the violin, you just put the violin, everything you write for a violin, you write on the E string, it will cut through the orchestra and just go. No E string on a cello. <laughs> so we are in trouble there. Everything is way lower. So it's, it's difficult. And in a way, he probably struggled. He also struggled with this concerto on a very personal level. Uh, because, uh, in a way, he, the love of his life, whose sister he married, she was dying during the composition of this cello concerto, and in a way you can hear it, because, you know, the, the last movement that is this kind of march-like and brilliant piece of music, you expect that to get more and more energy until it ends in absolute glory. He doesn't do that. He actually calms everything down, and in a way you can relate the, the bars before the ending to a soul going to heaven. The, it was, I think, a very personal moment for him until the last glory happens. And you can read more about that in your program notes, and, and I would recommend doing that if you have time before the concert, and if not, after. Lots of people end up reading them after, including me. Samuel Barber's souvenirs are delightful pieces. And, and the program notes, <laughs> they lead off saying, Samuel Barber spent a lot of time in bars. <laughs> Not meaning musical measures, but, you know, <laughs> bars, drinking in New York with a pal of his, and enjoying the music making that went on. 
in that environment. And so he wrote this suite of tangos and foxtrots for piano four hands and played them with his friend. And then they, he orchestrated them for a ballet, which I've never seen, though I can imagine it would be delightful. And Barber is really famous for the adagio for strings and his violin concerto, wonderful pieces. One of my favorite Barber things is the hesitation tango in, in these souvenirs, which is a man and a woman in a room, in a hotel, getting to know each other. And it's equal parts sweet and sexy, and it's got that tango rhythm, and the clarinets are so beautiful, and it's just great. I love that. And you told me backstage that it's harder, that this piece as a whole is harder to play than we think it is. I, I think so. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really delicate and uh, exposed, and uh, the, the details have to be so carefully considered. Some uh, wonderful English horn solos. And yeah. Carlos, you have to get the tone of it just right. Well, you can't sound like you're, like you're milking it too hard or that you're making fun of it. You know, I, as an interpreter, I always try my very best. Whether it is good enough, I don't know. I assume that one thing that we as an orchestra in the Souvenir by Barber do quite a bit more than anybody else who even dares to touch this uh, piece as an orchestra, we use way more freedom. I mean, tempi fluctuate, they move along. It's not, uh, because the thing that is fascinating about the Souvenir by Barber is we all know Barber and that is the truth about him. Actually, this is a very serious composer, very probably a very, aside from going to bars all the time, probably a very earnest, um, as, a, as an artist, very earnest. Uh, and you, th you look at all his work and you think, and then the souvenirs, in a way, it's like occasionally, once he wanted to have some fun. So he writes the souvenirs, just remembering the old days that are long gone. And it's very idiomatic. It's a little bit like Salon music. And uh, the fact that he later orchestrated it is a blessing. I think, I'm not a pianist, uh, but I think actually to play this piece, Piano for Hunts, is easier than the orchestral version. The orchestral version is really well done and really difficult. I mean, and maybe that is one of the reasons why, he, I mean, this is kind of an unknown piece by Samuel Barber. Nobody plays this. Um, aside from us, of course. <laughs> I'm really glad you're going to include it on that CD. Well, That's it's, welcome. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, you can argue about that because the CD that we are producing essentially tackles pieces by living composers, American living composers, I think with one exception, and I might even be wrong on that, all the pieces are 21st century, which is like, whoa! But, and this, I, it was not for me a selling point. I didn't put the barber there for a selling point. I just thought, I just want to record this piece because there is one recording out there in the world, one, for orchestra, and it's whatever it is. Uh, and I thought, we actually as an orchestra can do really a great job with this piece. And on top of that, um, it's also very enjoyable. And in a way, that is, it is one of the reasons why I decided to turn the order of this program upside down. Because I, for me, I needed Kenji in the middle, but I needed everybody, the orchestra and you, kind of rested, like you have to, before Kenji's piece, you have to like do this. So that's your assignment in the <laughs> intermission. Which is brought to you by Elephant's Delicatessen. That's not true, <laughs> just a bad joke. But they do support all classical Portland, I'm happy to say. Speaking of which, so Carlos and the gang have a new CD of all Haydn symphonies. Carlos loves Joseph Haydn's music. 
We'll be playing all of it next Thursday night at 7. Brandy Parisi interviewed Carlos about that, so she weaves that into the program. And then next Friday, there's a CD release party, and that recording will officially be available. And it has a really cool cover photo of Carlos in his leather jacket. <laughs> Looking kind of Marlon Brando-like, you know, back in there. Yeah, it's pretty I good. I worked hard on that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, isn't this a wonderful concert? And I just love the fact that the Oregon Symphony commissions local living guys to write music, and they record it, and they have events like this so you can come and be part of it. It's all wonderful. Thanks for being here. Kenji Bunch, Carlos Calmar. Robert McBride. And thou. <laughs>